Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we'll commence at, at verse 11. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Hear the word of God. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. May God bless the reading of his holy and infallible word. Now, when young men ask old men um, about setting out as preachers, we often say, well, try and do something fresh. You know, go to a, a passage of Scripture that people haven't heard of very much and uh, see what truths you can bring out and bring it. People will love to hear have a passage of scripture they've not heard before, spoken on. And yet, um, when we get older, it's John 14, 15, John 3, Ephesians 1 and 2, and Luke 15 that we turn to and find the comfort and the blessings that those passages of Scripture provide to be the bedrock on which all our relationship with Almighty God is given. This parable then, um, it has its own validity and finality. It's more accurate and more moving and even more profound than a series of propositions about grace, the picture of the prodigal son is very evocative and open-minded. It remains hooked in a memory cell. You heard it in Sunday school. You heard it when dad read from the scriptures and you were a little boy and you've never forgotten it. And it's what we fall back on again and again. And I want this picture. I want it to remain in your minds then um, throughout this, this weekend. Um, 
an old man running to kiss his son on his way back home. I want to look first of all at the rebellion of the son. This boy, his father was a landowner, and one day he said to his father, Gimme, and he didn't say, Gimme a coat of many colors or a white stallion, but he said, Give me my legal share of the estate. And receiving that, he would forfeit any right he had to his father's land, and all that remained would pass on to his older brother. When a father divided the property between the sons, the younger son then would change his share into cash. It would be valued, and then his father would retain that half, and he would take the money that was the selling of half his father's land. The shame that would bring on the family would be added to the shame that his son already had brought to his father by going to him and asking for his half now. It was like saying to his father, I wish you were dead. The father bore both these blows in a remarkable way without any recrimination. There are people in cultures that have not been influenced by the Christian gospel that find this story incredible. A friend, he is in a part of London which is a multiracial area and he has a group of people, a group of boys that play pool and ping pong on a Friday night and then he tells them Bible stories. And he told them this story and he said to them, now what would happen in your country if uh, a son asked his father for his share of the land. And the boys talked among themselves, and then they said he'd kill his son. And so you are finding grace here already in a father's listening to his boy and doing what this boy asks of him. What incredible grace! We're told the boy took all that he had, he turned everything, the flocks, the herds, the land, what it grew into cash, and off he set, he wasn't going back. Everything was taken. He took no pleasure in the company or the conversation of his father. He longed to be out from the confines of that home. He would put as many miles as he could between himself and that house. He found the old life restricting and suffocating and narrow, and he headed far from where he had been raised to another country. Jesus says, a distant country, so not Moab or Babylon, but through that country to a distant country. He was choosing a life of paganism rather than the life of living in the promised land. He was turning his back on the covenant people of God. He wanted no reminders of God. And that is so illogical and impossible a step to take because God can wake you up at three o'clock in the morning and he can remind you of himself and of yourself and your sin and your need. If we take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, God will meet us there. When Ernest Riesinger testified to John Riesinger, his brother, until John was fed up with him, John set off and went to St. Louis and had a job as a roof contractor there. And the first morning on the job at their tea break, a coffee break, a man turned to him and said to him, uh, John, have you ever thought of the claims of Jesus Christ? God has his way of speaking to you and finding you wherever you are. In this distant country then, the boy made new friends, spoke another language. There were new patterns to the year and to the week. There were new clothes and fashions that he wore. And uh, he was saying to himself, I've got away. I've, I've escaped from it all. Um, I hated it so much. Nobody knows me here. Whatever I want, 
I won't have my father standing at the door saying, you said you'd be home at half past nine and it's 10 o'clock. I wouldn't have his frown, his disapproval. He answered to no one, and so he could enter into the forbidden pleasures that the distant country offered to him. You understand, it didn't mean that he could now go to 21st birthday parties and he could go to wedding celebrations. We can go to 21st birthday parties and celebrations because our Savior went to parties and celebrations. They're legitimate for the disciples of God. His motto was, spend, 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 for tomorrow we die. And so he gathered lots of hangers-on. There's a new kid on the block, and he's got money, and he wants fun, fun, fun. And so every itch was scratched, and he gathered lots of hangers-on, and every appetite was satisfied. He deprived himself of no new sensation. He sowed to the flesh. He thought, ah, that'll be the fulfilled life, the flesh. And the companions had no difficulty in helping him to spend money on hunting trips and on old wine and on feasts and on women. And soon everything had gone. He went one day and there were a few coins at the bottom of the bag he hid away. No money left, no family to turn to. Everyone in Britain has got an uncle and aunt who live in London, and when there's a conference in London, they go and stay. Or if they go into a show or a soccer game, then they've got someone to stay with. He had no one to stay with in the distant country. And on top of that, there was a recession caused by a fierce drought, dust and winds and unemployment and starvation and people fleeing to the city, hoping that there could be some recovery there. The dream ended in the flaming light of an endless burning sun, and his friends were no more. And he was faced with the reality of the groaning world that many face day after day. He could still fall lower, for a Jew to have anything to do with pigs was bad enough to have him feeding them. As his new companions every day, that was despicable. Could he fall any further? Yeah, he was hungry enough to devour their food. It was very bad news. His degradation had reached a new low. He not only herded the swine, he herded with them. He was in bondage to poverty among the pigs. What began as one thrill after another ended in serfdom. He was like a party drinker who becomes a drunk. He was like a drug addict who becomes a drug user who becomes an addict. He was like a promiscuous person who gets a sexually transmitted disease. The party had become a prison. And that's what sin does. The boa constrictor tightens its grip on you. Are you seeing the picture here then? You see the depths to which this boy fell. You know there's no redeeming feature about this lad. From the time he asked his father for his portion of his inheritance and heads off as far as he can go to the field of pigs. You see, you can um, allegorize this parable and say, the prodigal son is the sinner. You can say that he's a type of every sinner who's a long way from God. And then before we know it, we're saying to every man and woman and those middle-aged ladies of the utmost decorum who are the backbone of the congregation, we can say to them, there you are with the pigs and the prostitutes, squandering all that a loving Father has given to you. That is not the message of this parable. This man is not the run-of-the-mill Philadelphia sinner. This man is how he is described in this parable, a rake, a fool, a drunkard, a waster, a derelict, a heartbreaker, 
That is what he is. He doesn't stand here as a spiritual symbol of the ordinary sinner. He stands in this parable as a symbol of the sinner in the gutter, a sinner in the pits, as far as you can low, as low as you can fall on the waterfront, on death row. He's the extreme. He's thrown out of low company. If ever there was a son whom a father would refuse, it would be this boy. If ever there was a sinner that God would reject, it would be this man, this prodigal, this Saul of Tarsus, the torturer, this Jesus hater, this Gadarene demoniac, this John Newton. He's not an ordinary sinner. This is a man on the lowest rung of the ladder, an inch above the surface of the cesspit, and he's sinking into it. Paul talks of the chief, the worst sinner. First Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am. I am the foremost. Um, it's that exaggerated word, the, the, I am the protos, I am the first. How was Paul the first when he was a blasphemer? His tongue demeaned the Son of God. He belittled, he mocked. Here is Jehovah Jesus, and Paul spurned him. I was a persecutor. He persecuted the church of God violently. He tried to destroy it. He was a murderer. He was imprisoning. He was torturing. He was insolent. He was haughty and proud and arrogant, and he knew it and he felt it. He was persecuting Christ himself, so he was sinning against his own destiny and sinning against his great knowledge of Scripture and sinning against the nearness he had to the historical Jesus and the blood of the martyrs face to face. He was the least deserving of mercy, yet he received grace abounding. Here is this prodigal, and we think of the angels, Michael and Gabriel, and they're looking down, and they're talking to one another. Is he the worst, Michael? I don't know, Gabriel. It seems to me what privileges this fellow has had, what a wonderful family he is a part of, and riches. Is he the worst? Was King Saul worse than him, do you think? Oh, I don't know. Maybe he was the Gadarene demoniac. Was he the worst? Yes, but it was demons in him wasn't it? Or is it this man? And the angels are discussing, and the angels are saying, surely the Almighty, he's gone too far for the Almighty to show mercy on him. It reminds us that no matter how bad we've been, you know, Lloyd-Jones has got a, a book on called Spiritual Depression, and he's got a, one sermon in that book called That One Sin, the one great fall in your past. And the devil wakes you up and tells you and reminds you, and you think about her. Where is she? How you hurt her? And how bad it was, and how cruel you were. That worst sin. Can there be abundant grace and mercy to cover it? Yet here is a man, and it's the worst possible scenario for him, the most abandoned, the most selfish, the wretched man, and yet there is a road from where this boy was in that field of pigs to the Father. There was a road. And there is a road from where you are this morning. There is a road from where you are to the living God, the God of grace, the God of love, the God who abounds in mercy and compassion. And so there's the rebel, the rebel son. Secondly, there is the repentance of this son. And you see, the theme running through this chapter is not that God loves sinners, but that God loves repentant sinners. He rejoices in sinners repenting. It's there in verse 7. It's there again in verse 10. So what is this word repentance? 
What does it mean to repent? Well, it's here so visibly and wonderfully in the parable of the prodigal son. Um, what happened to him? Two, three things happened to him. Firstly, he, he came to himself. He came to his senses. Verse 17, he, he woke up. He saw what he'd done. He realized that his life at that moment was a wretched life a wrong life. He knew where he was at. He was far from home. He was penniless. He was homeless and hopeless, disgraced, discredited, abandoned. And he came to himself. And not the typical sinner, but the worst sinner. Yet isn't it true that everyone who truly comes to Jesus Christ must look at himself and examine his heart and examine his past and see his character and the ruin that he has brought into his own life and the people that he has hurt. Maybe some even here are still bearing the marks of their own perdition. Maybe your sin is notorious. And when we come to ourselves, we see it. We see the notoriety of our lives, the shameful falling that has characterized so much and so long a part of our lives. You know, you would have thought that this boy would have always seen this that when he got to the far country and spent the money there, it was not fun, fun, fun. But the morning after was, is that all it was? The waking up from drunkenness, the coming away from women, the laughter, the killing of animals. It wasn't the thrill that he thought it would be. There are some men, they're so abandoned, and and you know that. They're in your neighborhood. They may be in your family. And you look at them, and you think, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Bad news again. They must know the hurt that they are causing. They must know what they're doing. The alcoholic he must know. The pedophile knows. The drug addict is aware of what he's doing to his health and to his church and to his loved ones. He must know. Surely he's come to his senses. But you go to the Old Testament and you read there the life of a wonderful man, King David, the man who wrote Psalm 23. And that man committed two of the foulest crimes He took a man's young wife and he impregnated her. And then to cover his shame, he killed the man who was a brave young soldier and killed him. And he didn't seem the least troubled in those choices that he had made. There was no contrition. You'd think he'd come to himself, he'd come to his senses. The the week afterwards, he would lie on the ground and beat his breast and sob his heart out at what all the privileges he'd had. And now what had he done with them? And he couldn't sleep at night and was overwhelmed with remorse. But it wasn't like that with David. And God has to send a prophet called Nathan to tell him a story It makes him angry with another man with a far less heinous crime than his. And Nathan says, you are the man. You are the man. You are the woman. God puts his finger on us. How many men and women in Philadelphia, their sin is staring them in the face. They haven't come to their senses. They're standing in the forecourt of judgment and on the threshold of 
of eternity, what have they got? They've got the baubles of this life. They've got the gewgaws and toys of our materialism, the remnants of a career, some property, some family, some money in the bank, a condo somewhere down in New Jersey on the coast, some memories, some money. That's all. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. We have our goals, our objectives. We. We want to earn 100,000 a year, and then we earn that, and we are paying more taxes, and it's not all that much money today, and so on. We say, just as we're going to grasp the glittering prize, it's vanished, it's still in the future somewhere. John Milton says, the moment we think the prize is in our grasp, come the blind furies with Arab horrid shears and they slit the thin-spun line. What, what, what do men have? You know, I don't want to sentimentalize, but some of the great statesmen of the last decades, men like Ronald Reagan, a great president, Winston Churchill, a great prime minister, Harold Wilson, Labour Prime Minister in Britain, all the achievements, all the ego-reinforcing attainments of outstanding lives, their pictures on coins and in post offices, receiving the plaudits and the accolades of the United Nations and the countries they visit, and their day, weekly trips to the royal family. And yet, in their final years, what did those men have? It seems to speak so eloquently of the insubstantial nature of human attainments, because Reagan, Ronald Reagan, had attained so much, and yet, at the last, he didn't know it. Didn't recognize Nancy when she came into his room to see him each, each day. Churchill, just the same, just the same. Repentance begins when a sinner comes to his senses, comes out of the shadowlands of life without God, into the bright reality of self-understanding and self-evaluation. You see, the gospel that we preach is not a description of fantasy. It is a call to reality. The only reason everyone listening to us should become Christians is because it's true. The third day he rose again from the dead. The tomb was empty, the body was gone, and he appeared then for almost six weeks talking to ones and twos and sevens and elevens and five hundred, and they, they never, never forgot. And they'd always want to tell you what it was like seeing him again. You sure it wasn't a ghost? No, <laughs> it was him. We could, we could touch him. And this is what he said to me. And they would say again and again of the livingness of Jesus. In him was life. So the first thing he came to himself. Have you come to yourself? And then secondly, he remembered his father. The noun father, the name only occurs once in the parable so far, but from verse 17 it occurs six times, the father, the father, the father, and so on. How important that is, you know the, you, you know the shorter catechism, I trust many of you know it, and it tells us what repentance is, it tells us that repentance begins by an apprehension of the mercy of God. That's where repentance begins. But God is merciful. 
and I'll turn. I'll turn from my unbelief. I'll turn from, though I've offended him, God is merciful, the apprehension of his mercy. Though you have been so proud and vain, God can be merciful to you. You see, someone will only repent if they have hope. A glimmer, a maybe, some encouragement to think that the door won't be slammed in their face or that they'll never be able to unlock it and get into the presence of God. Jesus says, him that comes to me, I will in no wise, in no way will I cast him out. No way will I open the door a fraction and slam it shut. No way, he says. Sinners, Jesus will receive, sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been, where you spent last night. It doesn't matter if you come grieving, broken, but your sin. There's no way you'll be rejected. No way. There is that hope. There is that glimmer in every man. What, what caused it? What caused it in this man? Well, you see, in his upbringing, around the family table and in the devotions and the prayers of his father, where he and his brother and his mother sat week day by day, something had been implanted indelibly in the consciousness that whenever things went wrong and when they went badly wrong, he could always go home. He must always come back. He hadn't been told, if you'd bring disgrace on the family, don't bother to come back. He'd not been told that. He hadn't been conditioned to the view, if you let us down, don't think about coming back. If you bring shame on our house, on our family name, then stay away. He'd been told, and he saw this truth in his father, who had given him half his possessions, as he was legally bound to. He saw in his father such grace. However low you go, son, however deep the abyss, however appalling the degradation, you must always feel this is your home. The door will be open to you, son. And I would beg all biblical Christians and plead with all parents that they give their children the same absolute and unconditional security that your sons and daughters know if you and they face the ultimate in tragedy, they can still come home. If they become drunkards, they can come home. If they marry the wrong people, they can still come home. If they get AIDS or sexually transmitted diseases, they can come home. If they get pregnant, they can come home. If they have an abortion, they can come home. If they end up in jail, you'll visit them. You'll meet them on the day they're released and bring them home. They must have, they need to have that assurance. It's one of the most basic elements of the divine pedagogy. And that's how God trains his children, that our fatherhood is mirrored on his wonderful, loving mercy and kindness to us. And this son comes to his senses, and there he is, alone, with pigs, penniless, friendless. And where can he go? Well, there's that whitewashed cottage where he spent those happy years of boyhood. 
and a loving father and mother. He'd go home. What else is repentance if it's coming to yourself and going to your Father? It is also an imperfect grace in every one of us. Like our, our faith, it's not 100% pure and strong. Our repentance is just the same. So that this boy a long way from home, he thinks, oh, but will he open the door to me? I, I must remember what to say now. Um, I must um, say, um, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, uh, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Um, make me as one of your hired servants. That's what I'll say. Can I come back as... As just a, a workman, a laborer for you. That's what I'll say. And so, as he walks back, he rehearses this, those sentences, Father, I've sinned against heaven and sight. I'm not worthy to be called your child. Make me as one of your hired servants. He went full of doubt, full of uncertainty. This family he had hurt so deeply, so... He said, um, when it's harvest time and the men from the community stand in the village square and the four men from the farms come and they choose you and you and you and you, I'll be standing there. Hire me. I, I, I know the farm. I know the fields. I know the brooks. I know the hedges. Won't you let me back to work a bit on the farm? Those were his thoughts. He would make peace with his father by his lowly expectations. You see, he did not have a view of the greatness of the grace of his father, this wonderful man. And when many, many come to believe in God, they have no idea of the infinite glory of a God who is a spirit, eternal, unchangeable, in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. A God who, where we have abundant sins, he has far more abundance in his grace and mercy than all our sins put together. I'm saying to you, you don't need to wait until your faith is rock solid, until you are sure God exists, and that your repentance is a strong grief, and you've turned your back on the things that you used to do, and then you're ready to present yourself. It's not like that. It never is like that. The older we are, the more conscious we are of the feebleness of our faith. Weak is the effort of my heart and cold my warmest thought. When I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. Then, not before, then. But God acts. He sees. If your faith is as thin as a spider's thread and it goes from your heart and it's lodged into Jesus Christ, that thread is strong enough, as strong as a horse holding a battleship to the quayside. It's strong enough to take you across the bottomless pit and take you across the lake of fire and present you faultless before God. It's not great faith that saves, it's true faith in a great Savior that saves us. So this boy went home pleading that his father would at least make him a servant. His father was going to make him a son. Thirdly, the return. The return. We've looked at his ruin and his repentance and now his return or the reconciliation or the renewal. There are lots of nice R's. You can describe this 
he walks home far slower than he took that same route those months earlier. And he finally climbs the hill and he looks down the country lane to the White House there. And he pauses, full of misgivings and fears that even here he'll be rejected and friendless. And every day, his father pulled the curtain on the window near where he sat and he looked up the lane to see if there might be someone walking down the path. Many times a day he did it and his wife knew what he was doing. She never teased him. She grieved too. And he looked and there was no one. And the weeks and the months went by. And then that day came, that never to be forgotten day and he pulled the curtain aside and he looked and he looked again and he rubbed his eyes, his old eyes and there seemed to be a figure on the road, slowly moving, stopping and he got out of his chair and he crossed the kitchen and he opened the door and he went across the farmyard and opened the gate and stood in the path and he looked and is that his son? And he looked, and the boy moved. He knew the strut, and he began to walk, but he couldn't walk. He began to run. Oh, be careful, old man, running. Your bones are brittle. Oh, be careful, but he's not going to stop. What if he changes his mind and goes back? And he pants and he runs and he gets nearer and nearer. It's his son. He's aged. He stinks. He's dirty, but it's his boy. And he comes up to him and he wraps his arms around him and he clutches him to himself and he weeps over him and he says, I'll never let you go again. And three breathless servants come running up. And he turns to the one and he says, um, go for the robe of sonship. You know, it's hanging up in the, in the wardrobe upstairs. And there are sandals uh, on the floor of the wardrobe. Bring them here. And the second, he says, now, there's a ring. It's in a little black box. It's in the chest of drawers in the living room. The second draw down on the left, bring that here. And then the third, he says, now we know why we've been feeding that fatted calf. Call the, call the players in. Let them bring their banjos and bagpipes and tell the women it's a day off and tell them to dress up. There's going to be country dancing. Clear the farmyard. And the three went off. And did the son then begin his confession? Father, I have uh, sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm not worthy to be called. He cuts him down. He doesn't let him finish what he has to say. He doesn't say to him, what in the world did you do? Do you know you broke your mother's heart? Why didn't you get in touch with us? Why didn't you send a message, a note, to tell us you were all right? We worried sick about you. How could you do this to us? None of that at all. None of it. It's all over in the joy of the boy who was lost is found the boy who was dead to them is alive again. Soon there's the smell of roast veal in the air and the sound of musical instruments being tuned and played and shy women putting on their best dresses and looking there and there's dancing and there's feasting because the boy 
who was lost has been found. Everything forgotten in the restoration. Now, we've got to translate this wonderful picture into, into words, into theological and biblical words and moral words, and mighty familiar words. We've got to fill those words with the wonder of what happened that day when that father embraced that boy and took him safely home. It's a picture, isn't it, of what happens when we, when we are saved, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that he gives us everything that we need for a new life in Christ. He freely pardons all our sins, all our past sins, all our present sins, all our future sins. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ so that we can bold stand in that great day for who ought to my charge shall lay? Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my glory are, my glorious dress. We have him. He then starts immediately to work everything that happens to us for our good. And then he begins to supply all our need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus immediately. He makes us heirs of God, joint heirs, so that what Christ deserves as his beloved son, we obtain. He does that for us. He makes us his children with all of divine protection and divine provision and divine pedagogy and how we henceforth should live, all of that. He doesn't hurl our pasts at us. He forgives and forgives and forgives. We who were so unsanitary are now made whiter than snow. Your sins were like crimson, not any longer. And this boy, I'm sure he would have had some words to say, um, Father, um, you know what I did. Oh I'm, 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 oh, I'm so ashamed. I'm so sorry. Be quiet now. You're home. Son, you're home. You're home. Christians can't believe that God can be so gracious. They think as they walk through the streets, there's a big red illuminated arrow pointing down at them. This is the man who was in prison for living atrociously, and everyone knows it. They can't believe there's no such arrow. The arrows were thrust into the wounded side of Christ. And the washing with water and blood is ours now forevermore. The past is past, and we are to forget the things that are past. It is immediate sonship. It is not, ah oh well, five years you live in the loft above the barn, and five years you earn your wages as a servant, and then we'll have a, a family get-together, and we'll decide we can trust you, and we'll bring you back, and you've got to bide your time, and, and, and then the blessings of sonship will be yours. It is not that. He begins a good work. He begins it. And he performs it until the day of Jesus Christ. All things are ours, purchased by the cross, applied to us by God the Holy Spirit. And this man had walked all the way home, and all he had thought was, maybe at harvest time, they'll make me a hired servant, make me a cattle man. His father makes him a son. His son, his beloved son, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. We say, ah, 
I, I, I won't be able to make it. I've done so badly in the past. I, I'll, I'll do it again. I can't live up to it. Can you, can you live up to it? Can you? Can you be a saint? Can you be like the people you admire in your congregation that seem so mature and caring and patient and wise? Can your family be like those families you admire where husband and wife so sweet with their children? Can, can you be? You can be. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If any man is in Christ, He's a new creation. All things are new. Many a fall and many a restoration day by day. We come so tremulously. We have nothing to give. We only bring our shame for the past. And we are met with complete love, total pardon, the riches of baptism into the body of Christ. That's the way God reconciled sinners. That's his grace. Believe it, O oh sinner, believe it. Believe the message of grace. It's true. I'll go back to my father. What, what changed this boy? Well, firstly, he came to himself. Have you, have you come to yourself? Have you faced up to what you are? Have you faced up to the guilt and depravity of your sin? The alienation in your heart towards God? The way you offended him? The way you're under condemnation? Have, have you faced up to your sin? Have you done that? Why not? Aren't these things real? Aren't these things grievous to you? Have you come to yourself about your need of forgiveness and mercy? In Christ. No one ever came to Christ without making that decision. I will look at myself and confess my sin. And then um, you turn from your sin and you're going to go to your Father. You're going to address God. You're going to begin to speak to Him. You're going to say how sad you have been, how badly you've lived how ashamed you are, you're going to tell him. You, you talk to him. You must talk to him. You must start now talking to him. In your heart, you're saying, this message is for me. And um, I know, I know, I've, I've done badly. And you must start talking. And you must keep talking to him until he starts talking to you. Until you have an inward witness of the Holy Spirit that confirms the greatness of his mercy and his love for you, a sense of peace, a sense of wonder, a sense of joy, that he's your God, your Father, your Savior. Many a person comes to himself and forgets. Many a person comes to a decision and it doesn't last more than a day. Many a person sees the wonderful love of, of God and thinks, oh, it would be wonderful if I could have it. And then there's this baseball and there's the music and there is buddies. Where, where have you stopped? At the first point, when you've come to yourself? At the second point, when you were admitted you were a sinner? Many have stopped there. You've seen God. There have been times in your teen years where you were very close, where you considered yourself a Christian, and, but then you stopped. Oh, don't, don't, please. Don't stop. Don't stop. Start again. Start again. You have a luxury car and one day it stops and you don't abandon it. You think of your car more than you think of your soul? He got up and went. 
not enough to know the shorter catechism. It's not enough to sit under biblical ministry and memorize chunks of the Bible. It's not enough to be morally a, a good, living, sensible person. There are many such, and some of our parents were such people, and we thank God for them. Not enough. I am offering you a father and his reconciling love. I'm offering God who comes running to you, to meet you, all the way to you, to embrace you and to kiss you and never let you go again. If you ask me what saved this boy, I would say, the abundant love of his father saved him. If you ask me what saved this boy, I would say his journey back home saved him. Both of these, both of these are essential, and that's a journey I want you to take from where you are to where Christ is. If he was in the front here, I would say come to the front. But the word is nigh you. It's in your mind. It's in your heart. It's the word of faith of a loving father reaching out and grasping a prodigal son who will not let you go. Receive his love now. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. Once again, let's come to ourselves. Let's appreciate the mercy of God. Let's make up our minds to go. And having done that, you come. You start this journey. For the rest of your life, it's a journey from the shadowlands to the bright healing light of the presence of God to be with him forevermore. You come. Come with us. You come from now. You come just as you are to God just as he is God is love and he's brought me here to tell you of his love and he's brought you here to experience again the wonder of a bounding mercy to the chief of sinners Heavenly Father, bless your word now to us and make us so thankful. You've shown us our sin and we've been cut to the quick and convicted of our own many, many shortcomings. But we thank you most of all for your grace in Jesus Christ that opens up your arm and comes running to hug us to yourself. Oh, we thank you that ever we've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and that ever power was given to us to entrust ourselves into your hands. Receive us now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.